are listening to the Down the Wormhole podcast, exploring the strange and fascinating relationship between science and religion. This week, our hosts are... My name is Ian Benz, Associate Professor of Elementary Science Education at UMC Charlotte. And if I had to be any celestial object, I would be a black hole. Love that gravitational pull, baby. Rachel Jackson, Rabbi at Agudas Israel Congregation in Hendersonville, North Carolina. And if I had to be any celestial object, I would be an asteroid. Kendra Holtmore, PhD student at Boston University. And I would be the recently spilled tardigrade colony on the moon that a spacecraft accidentally left behind. Uh, Zach Jackson, UCC pastor in Reading, Pennsylvania, and I would switch places with Elon Musk's Tesla Roadster. <laughs> well, I guess you could say that is currently a celestial object. It's absolutely a celestial object. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's actually pretty. That's that's well played. I like that one. <laughs> Where is it right now? That was we left track field. It. Yeah. Uh, you can track it. Yeah. I think it's a couple yeah. million years it's going to crash back into Earth. Well, yeah. well hopefully it won't case. actually crash. It'll just burn up. Sure. Can you imagine? How did, how, what, what are you in for? I got hit by a falling car. It's those, <laughs> those lithium batteries exploded and, you know. Car crashed into my house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it rained into your house? No, it fell into my house from space. <laughs> That crazy jackass from a million years ago. Didn't even have totally. insurance. I know. <laughs> Elon. Oh, it's terrible. Okay. So, Ian, why are we talking about space objects? So, we are starting our new series um, on space, our new miniseries on space. And after kind of going back and forth, we decided that uh, it would be kind of interesting to um, come up with what we think could be um, in essence, the next Copernican revolution, or others would call it a paradigm shift. So what would be the next major revolution that kind of changes the way we view science or some aspect of science? And so uh, before we get into that, we thought it'd be important just to give a general overview of Copernicus and uh, what his work uh, did. Um, so Copernicus, uh, Nicholas Copernicus, was uh, Polish. He died in 1543, I believe. He was also religious, like he was uh, ordained, I believe, and then obviously a scientist, and he did lots of different things. Um, but what he proposed uh, was the heliocentric model, which is that the um, sun is the center of our solar system instead of the earth. And uh, what was very interesting about his work actually is that he didn't really have a good explanation and evidence to back up his um, ex his proposed um, new model, the heliocentric model. And it wasn't until Galileo and others several decades later uh, found evidence to support it that it was more widely accepted. But the general idea is, is that he, he did notice from some different observations that uh, the way the um, planets that we knew of at the time uh, appeared in the sky, that their movement did not really match uh, what was going on with the original model, the Ptolemaic model that was accepted at the time or the geocentric model. And when his book was published, I don't know if you guys knew this, it's actually really cool. So when his book was published, a individual who's part of, I believe the Catholic church at the time wrote a preface and put that in the book after Copernicus died. And at first people didn't realize that it wasn't written by Copernicus. And in the, in the preface, it pretty much argued that what all of this is not real. Like everything in this book is not <laughs> true. And uh, they learned later, I forgot how long it took for them to figure that out, but they realized later on that it was not, it, that Copernicus did not actually write that preface, that the church was that challenged by his work. Um, but as I said, it took a long time for that to be kind of the accepted model because the evidence or the mechanisms he did not have at the time, Copernicus did not have in his explanation. Um, and the church fought it and other scientists at the time fought it. And actually there was a book written in the 1950s or 60s, I believe, that said that no one had ever read it. And so, uh, or the people at the time had not really read it. And it wasn't until much later that people actually read it. And so, um, Owen Gingrich, a 
a history historian of astronomy, actually traveled the world finding all of the first and second editions of Copernicus's book and did an analysis on them and actually found like Galileo's version of the book, Galileo's copy and saw the notations within the book itself uh, and was wow. able to prove that no people did actually read it and took it seriously at the time, um, which was fascinating. There's actually a copy of the book yeah. at uh, University of Virginia's library that I'll, I have a picture of me holding. I was really excited. And just to um, clarify, the yes. book that's being talked about is on the revolutions of celestial fears because he wrote a, right. he wrote other books, but this is right. Or I could I can't say it in another language, so that's the translation. Um, and the tr- and the the primary church that he was a part of is the Catholic Church. Again, just to you. just Thank to you. clarify, because there's I not remember the time. Yes, uh, he was a Renaissance area mathematician, astronomer, and ca- Catholic clergyman. Yeah. So, but his his work really did kind of uh, turn uh, science upside down and really was kind of the beginning of um, the scientific revolution, which, you know, lasted for a couple centuries, but it really was kind of one of the things that launched uh, societies and different cultures into the scientific revolution. So. And I think, I, I think that's great, Ian. I like how you talked about his science piece. I- I'm going to take it from a slightly different angle Mm -hmm. that the Copernican revolution wasn't just about the explosion of a scientific revolution, right? Moving us almost, again, it might have taken a hundred ish years, right? Because he died in 1543 and it, it took a little bit while to move from, um, say the Renaissance era to more in an enlightenment era or a scientific Mm -hmm. revolution. But I think, you know, he, he laid the groundwork in that way. I also think that one of his um greatest gifts was actually changing our understanding of ourselves so less about the science that was out there but more about having to recognize that we're not everything to to remove right. our narcissism and to remove and then refine how do you redefine your place in the world when you're not at its center and I think that's, I think that from a, a theological, philosophical, even sociological standpoint, that is one of the revolutions that he really gave us. In addition to his incredible, um, Renaissance man stuff, including the science, but from this, the, the, to move to, um, a heliocentric model, I think was really powerful in all of the other ways that we interact with each other. So I don't know if others, you know, if, and so when we, the reason I bring that up is when we then talk about um, using this term of Copernican revolution um, as as an event, and can that event then happen again? Can we use that terminology again? It was used in um, 19th, early 20th century with Einstein theory of Revol- relativity and quantum mechanics as a second Copernican revolution. Right. So how are we using that term? What is really changing when we're going through this? I think the word that captures sort of like the essence of these revolutions to to me is the word decentering, which I think is like what you both have already said in different ways, but it's a decentering or like a paradigm shift. The word or the phrase, the Kuhnian phrase that Ian uh, said earlier that, you know, we are not at the center and the old tools and ways of being in the world can no longer work as like the central perspective of how we engage. And, and so, and decentering can be both like a positive experience and also somewhat traumatic. (laughs) So there's like so much that changes that it, it really has so many implications for our philosophical, religious, theological systems as well. Well, and what I find fascinating about Copernicus and, and his work is, you know, and I did a very, very uh, glossed over, over um, or a very uh, brief overview Cursory. of his work. And yeah, thank you. I mean, it was just, it, but his, his contributions uh, were absolutely amazing. You know, what, what he did and what he started, I think is just very fascinating um, in the time frame it happened as well. And, you know, he worked, it wasn't like he wrote this book and came up with this explanation for our solar system in a, 
in like a year or something. I mean, he worked on this for decades and you know, published different ideas anonymously as a way to kind of see what would be um, the perception of others and how others would take it and took a long time to actually put his name to this work, which I, I find very interesting because it really is very telling of the time frame he was working in. And then also too, you know, just like realizing that people for the longest, as I said earlier, you know, what Owen Gingrich did in his book uh, titled the book that nobody read, you know, he, he wrote that particular book that was published in the early two thousands as a way to kind of combat the prevailing thought that people just never read this work until much later. Um, And he pointed out that, no, actually that's not true. And I just was looking that it's one of the most well-documented texts from like the first editions and next to the Gutenberg Bible. I mean, it's, and these texts are, I mean, they are amazing. The one that at UVA that I held there, you can see notations in the margins, but the thing is, is they have no idea who owned it, who was the original owner of that text, um, which I find fascinating. Right. So it really did have a major impact on how things worked at the time. I also love uh, when you were saying earlier, Ian, that Copernicus, he he didn't really have um, a great, a great swath of evidence to really support the, the Mm -hmm. like mathematical models and, you know, the, the scientific shift that he was proposing. And I I think I, I love that part of the story because I think that we often see science as something that only happens when you have this like 100% truth. And it feels that way once we're already like inside of an established paradigm. But when there are new scientific shifts, um, that is a combination of this like speculation and intuition and also like facts and math and like all the things. And I, I think that's the part that is less um, like common sense maybe about the like history of science is the unknown that you have to sort of risk stepping into in order to imagine how, how the world works beyond what you already know. And I think you see that again and again, um, you know, Copernicus being a great example of that, but even now all of the, the things that we're learning about space, it, like we we don't right. really know exactly what's going on, but we have a lot of intuitions, and you know our scientific paradigms are updated um, after you know hundreds of years. Somebody discovers something else, and now we're going to change what we consider scientific fact. And and I don't say that to 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 indicate that like science isn't real and you shouldn't trust it. No, that is not what I'm trying to say. But there is there's more to it than just you know. A plus B equals C. Uh, There's this intuitive side to it that's really fascinating. I mean, he wasn't the first to propose that uh, a heliocentric no. universe, right? Uh, Aristarchus, which was mm-hmm. 1,800 years before him, uh, said the same thing for uh, roughly the same reasons. And, um, you know, Eratosthenes calculated the circumference of the Earth using a shadow. <laughs> like, <laughs> the sorts of things that we are able to intuit before we have the the tools and technologies to measure and really uh, prove it, I think is, is really fascinating. Because now we're talking about, if we're thinking about what's the next Copernican revolution, um, where you read people talking about things like multiple universes or the cause of the Big Bang and those sorts of things are basically science fiction right now because we can't we can't measure that. You can't ask what came before time because <laughs> it's like asking what's more what's north of the North Pole. It's right. like the terms break down. But just because we don't have the tools right now uh, to to measure it doesn't mean that we we're not going to you know like we are constantly proving Einstein right every year as as our technologies are, are and our measurements are getting more and more precise and we're sending more and more uh, 
satellites into space and and whatnot, and we're proving a lot of the things that people just intuited previously. So I'm I'm really I love thinking about what is coming. Uh, what's coming down the pipe? Like, wh- what are the things that we're going to be able to measure in the, in the coming decades that were seem like science fiction today? Well, one of the things I think is so fascinating about space exploration is that you know how quickly it it seems to move at times. You know, we take for granted like the discovery of exoplanets, so planets outside of our solar system. I mean, we're discovering them all the time now right? We take that for granted, people who kind of follow this. But the first one was discovered in 1992, or was confirmed in 1992. That's less than 30 years ago. And now there's over 4,000 of them, right? And so you just, when you think about like how quickly it moves once they kind of, you know, just like the initial discovery of that first one, and then they realized how to do it just opened the floodgates. And so sometimes it's hard for me to think about you know, I, I just looked yesterday, just was briefly, you know, kind of curious, like some of the major space, you know, discoveries uh, because of space exploration over the past 10 years or something. And it's just mind boggling. You think, oh, that that just happened 10 years ago. I thought mm. we knew that a long, you know, and so it's, it's just really interesting where this could all go. Mm. And I do think that whenever I read things about uh, like recent discoveries in outer space, I, <laughs> I sometimes find myself having a hard time determining did I find an article that's really just like science fiction or is this real? Because I don't have the tools to understand how this could be possible. <laughs> like I, I found something recently. Um, I'm not sure where I, I can, I can find it for y'all, but uh, it was talking about how black holes might not just suck in everything and keep it there but that maybe things can be sucked into a black hole, break down, and then are reconstituted on the way out. And I was like, what? (laughs) That is, (laughs) I've spent my whole life thinking that is not how black holes work. And I know that we don't really know that much about the inner workings. You know, no one's been inside of a black hole personally, but um, it's just stuff like that that's so amazing and is also it does have this science fiction feel because it's like, you know that scientists are asking these questions, but part of this work, like we just, our technology is not, uh, it's getting better of course every day, but it's not like the perfect tools that we need to investigate all of the questions we have. And so you have to have some of the like speculation. And for someone who's just like, a lay person who just like loves science, it sometimes feels the same as science fiction and hard to sort it out. I, I totally agree. And I think that, um, you know, looking at, you know, looking at black holes or black holes, this idea of a, is there a wormhole on the other side? Like, is that the other side of the black hole that when it gets spit out, right? What is it? What does that really mean? And as we, we sort of investigate that, um, and also to Ian's point that, you know, we now take it for granted, exoplanets, or, you know, maybe this idea that there aren't any exoplanets. Oh, turns out there are. Oh, no, there's none. And the Goldilocks system where they're the perfect temperature between, you know, away from their sun. Nope, that's not true. There's plenty of Goldilocks planets out there, too. And so now we're getting into this, these questions. And those, those have really, like Ian said, only shown up in these last couple of decades. I remember, um, again, just a couple of decades ago, how old was the universe? Right? How just straight up, how old is the universe and how far back can we actually see in it? And I remember when we could only see, you know, a million years or a few thousand years, and now we're able to see um again, I'm I'm i I'm a little skeptical as Kendra. Like, was that science fiction? Was that hope? Or was that did they know that? Because I haven't found the scholarship articles about it. We know within the first day or so of the Big Bang. And so now we're looking at, well, what happened at the Big Bang? <laughs> and how many Big Bangs were there? Um, how many Big Bangs does it take to create a universe? <laughs> <laughs> so it it seems to me that for a lot of people, well, for most of human history, uh, God has been used to explain the things that we can't explain. Right, the, we call that the God of the gaps. So, 
God, we, we don't know how rain happens, so God makes rain happen. But then, uh, uh, I can't think it off the top of my head, uh, Greek early Greek scientist it explained the water cycle. And uh, oh, there we go. Um, now God doesn't do that. And then <laughs> like the more things that we discover and we can explain, the smaller God is and the smaller God is. And at this point, like when I get into a discussion with someone about science and religion and like that's where their God is, it usually ends at the Big Bang where they say, mm -hmm. Um, sure, sure, I can believe in evolution and I can believe in even cosmic evolution, but you know, it started somewhere and who, who started the big bang, right? That you can't explain that, that the big bang is God saying in the beginning, God spoke and, you know, let there be all the things. And I think that that if, if we're talking about Copernican revolutions, like things that decenter us from the universe, that's going to be one that's going to be harder than almost any other. I think that would be harder for devoutly religious people, um, well, theistically religious people to, to come to terms with than even discovering life, because that's kind of the last vestige, right? Of, of what, what we can give to God that we can't explain with purely natural terms. Um, and, and obviously we don't have the tools right now because when you get that close, you know, we're studying like the cosmic, the microwave, cosmic microwave background radiation that I get the words right. in the right order. Um, we're able to see a, a kind of, you know, remnant of what it looks like, but, the laws of the universe were set in motion because of that. And so we can't use the laws of the universe to look at the thing that made the laws of the universe just in the same way that you can't read like the Lord of the Rings and know like what Tolkien's eye color was. I, it, it does, the rules are set for the place where you're in. So we're going to need to come up with uh, with other ways of measuring other uh, to understand different uh, entirely different systems of laws in order to get to that place. But I think we will. Um, I, if, as long as we don't blow ourselves up first, I think we're going to get there. And when we do, I, it might be worthwhile to already have been thinking about it. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. And I think that even apart from the Big Bang, like there are other discoveries or, you know, things we have not yet discovered, but other speculations about the nature of the universe that I think will do the exact same thing um, as what you are saying, Zach, or, or something very similar, um, like thinking about the possibility of discovering life. And I think, you know, whether that's intelligent life or not, like something more microbial, I think if that happens, that will also have implications for the way that people read creation stories and understand the centrality of uh, human life and the human role as being like the caretaker of nature and all of this. Um, so I think that that also does something similar, which is, uh, you know, if the Big Bang changes the way that people perceive God, and the, like the characteristics of God, then I think the discovery of life would also have to change the the way that sacred scripture is read and understood in relation to to humans and and to God and like it's all interconnected. But it's really interesting to think about how that will change because I think the pattern is that some people will be very resistant and you know uh, um. A greater number of people, I think, will have this like adaptability and flexibility that has always been true when people read scripture. Like um, you, you kind of, I guess, I would say that people adapt to the circumstances that they're in to be able to read. And I'm like stop, trying to be careful the way I say this. I would say maybe read into the scripture what helps you make sense of your external circumstances. I realize that that's like not how everyone would see it. Maybe they would say that that's, it was always in the scriptures. So you're trying to extract the truth from it. But uh, yeah, like it's this, this like mutually influential relationship, I think.
And we're going to get into it in a couple of weeks, the implications of finding life. Adam literally wrote a book on it. Um, But just like off the top of your head, so we send a probe to Enceladus and we dig down under the ice and we find this uh, moon full of water. And in the water, we find microbial life. And it looks nothing like life looks like on Earth as it's adapted to living under a frozen sh- sheet of ice. And um, how does that affect um, our theology of of life, of creation, of uh, our specialness, and all of those things? <sighs> I mean, my answer to this question will be different because I think if you already sort of think of humans as being like somewhat insignificant, I don't think it really, I don't think these discoveries necessarily change a person's like theology or philosophy very much. Um, And I think even people who are religious, if you're talking about an evangelical Christian, the implications on their theology is going to be really different than someone who's like a Buddhist. Um, And so... I, th- I think what we are um, talking about here, or like wh- where I hear that question coming from is mostly uh, directed at, at, at traditions like the Abrahamic traditions that have this like theistic, particular, like anthropomorphic vision of God. Um, and yeah, I, I think that that, it, I'm not really sure what this would mean or if it would change much of anything for someone who's like, Buddhist or of another like non-theistic mindset. Um, and so it's mm. like it, it, these discoveries will still be life changing, no doubt, but I don't think they have to be as like theologically decentering um, in all cases. If humanity is already decentered, yeah. then finding life won't further, <laughs> won't further decenter. Mm-hmm. But if you have humanity in the center of God's plan for the universe, than finding other life might, right? Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know enough about other non-theistic religions, which is, I don't know if that's an appropriate statement. It must be an appropriate statement to make. Although, you know, depending who you talk to in the in the in, in Buddhism, is Buddhism actually a religion or is it a way of life? Is it an ideology? Um, as opposed to religion. So I think that that one's a little bit more uh, challenging for me to fully wrap my brain around. But for those religions which have a or multiple deities, and yet the human being is not the center of them, I think this could still impact still impact the decision or impact the theology in the sense of, well, what role do we play? What um what is our purpose if we, you know, if we were just a pawn in the game? Well, now knowing that there's a dozen other pawns might change how we feel about that. And as a 100% total aside, um, I just finished watching The Queen's Gambit. I think it was a Netflix miniseries about. We just chess. started it, so don't give away too much. I'm not going to give away anything. Okay. Um, you know, I don't, I don't really play chess. I know, I know how the pieces move, right? This, this is my level, right? I know how the pieces move, but I always thought the pawns, you just kind of like, you just kind of gave them away. <laughs> They're like the red shirts of Star Trek. Um, <laughs> but, Good analogy. Thank you. Because you know, we are talking about space. Right. But watching this show and watching chess players, you know, the pawns are actually very, very important. Right. They're not just something you, you give away. Um, they're the red shirts of the next generation, right? The, where they actually have the power. Um, <laughs> I'd bring Star Trek in there fully. So, so I don't want to say that we're just, you know, what power do we have? I, I think that that would change. And it, I think it would also change in this idea of, right? One of the articles that I read was, what if we don't find life? Hmm. Right. What, what if we don't? How will that actually change our ability to understand our place? What if in all of this searching to decentralize ourselves, it turns out we are actually alone? 
And how will that shift uh, uh, more, I think, for the more liberal, religiously liberal theologies? How will that actually shift our perception of self and or relationship to deity? Right? Because so much of what we talk about is in relationship to right? I in relationship to another human being or to the things on the planet or to a deity, right? I in relation to something else other than myself. Um, and how that would shift if we go searching and we find nothing. Except those Fine. tardigrades on the moon. Which we put there. <laughs> <laughs> or the car that we put there. Or the asteroid, which should be there. Or the black holes. And, you know, so it's interesting, except for Adam's pond scum. Um, or how, you know, he said it. No, he said pond scum. Mm-hmm. He did um, say pond scum. Yep. You know, except for that, we all chose things that that came from Earth. or 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 have nothing to do with life. So, so not, I, yeah, not, yeah. Right? Black holes, cars, asteroids, right? And, you know. Or what if the aliens that we find are actually just robots that humans made? And it's like an interstellar situation where mm-hmm. humans went ahead in space time and then they made the aliens and then the aliens came back and interacted with mm-hmm. present humans. Or like, <laughs> right? Or like. Mm-hmm. Rather than Interstellar, since that's your thing, I'll go. I'll go back to Star Trek. Go back to Star Trek. Um, Picard, right? And if anyone saw the the most recent series called Picard, so awesome, right? Maybe they were cre- right. They were these de- you know, these beings, and then they they went away for a long time, and then they came back, right? And we tried to right, that there was that evolution, and we created them, and then we went, oh no, what did <laughs> we do? I mean, it's just there's so many, and 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 I think this brings us back to the beginning of our conversation of we don't we don't know right that where we are now we it's we're blurring the lines of science fiction and science and where where science is in 2020 was definitely science fiction 70 years ago so mm-hmm. in 70 years from now what is science fiction today that will be science then mm-hmm. i think we have talked about this before on a previous episode but um i'm thinking about the the way that theories of evolution changed uh, theology mm, yeah. and again was like another decentering experience similar to the the Copernican revolution but um you know when when uh Darwin's theory of evolution really took hold in uh, our imagination like people came up with the gap theory to understand uh the Genesis creation story so I think in a previous episode we talked about like young earth creationists versus old earth creationism and um, how those different like theologies read Genesis one and two. Um, But I I think that that is why I'm not sure much will change in that it's, there's just like an adaptation that happens in how we read scripture. So just to like remind people the, you know, to account for something like the big bang and evolution that comes afterwards, the, um, the gap theory says that there is a lot of, time that happens in between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. So Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Right. Gap. Genesis 1-2, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And that that is just sort of like the quick fix (laughs) that kind of accounts for this new scientific theory and it's like not satisfactory to everyone but a lot of people took that as like a really (laughs) uh helpful and easy way to like update the interpretation of the creation story to account for what was happening um in scientific disciplines and and so i the point is that i think something like that will happen again like the way that people read the meaning of certain words in the creation story or in other books of the Bible, if that's what we're talking about in particular, it'll just change. Like when we're talking about animals and humans, um, maybe those 
uh, words will mean something more, will account for any possibility of like alien microbial life or like advanced technological robots or artificial intelligence. Like maybe it'll <laughs> all just be packed in. And I think, I think that makes sense to me just based on the way people historically have wrestled with their sacred texts. Um, so that's how I imagine that this will be resolved. It won't be the only way, but I think it'll be a way that sticks and that is useful for people who really want a continuity of scripture with like over time and space. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I want to. I want to add one piece to that that scripture and our understanding of how it then changes. Um, so I, I think I shared this before we were recording at some point. Right. So the Hebrew Bible doesn't start in the beginning. It starts Brishit bara Elohim et Shemayim ve'et Aretz. Right. Brishit bara is the beginning, um, and the letter Bet. Right. You can hear that B Brishit starts with the letter Bet transliterated as B. Um, but the letter itself, the shape of the letter, and remember Hebrew is read right to left, and the shape of the letter is closed on the top, closed on the right, and closed on the bottom, and open to the left. Um, and then there's this teeny tiny little like <laughs> uh, mixing mixing fonts. There's a serif is what it kind of looks like on the back of on the back of this letter pointing backwards pointing to where it came from and so there's this kabbalistic tradition of well asking the question well why didn't start why doesn't the scripture start with the first letter of the alphabet that would make a lot of sense said well because that is an open letter and what came before is not for us to know we can only look forward we can know that there was something that did happen by that little tail that little little serif piece um at the behind the bet but really what's important is looking forward is everything that's happening that we can understand not not what is beyond our understanding so it existed but that's that's not for us to worry about. So as things change, as we, and, and you know, that, that still works for the Big Bang. It's like, okay, so the Big Bang happened before the bet. Great. Right? That, that doesn't then impact the rest of it, right? Rishit bara Elohim et ve'etaret. And God created the, you know, the, the heavens and the earth. Great. That doesn't, that doesn't discount that the Big Bang happened because that happened before the bet. I don't need to worry about it. Yeah. And so it, it, it's a, it, perhaps it's a mystical thing. Perhaps it's a cop out. Perhaps it's just <laughs> hooey, right? You know, there's, everyone has a different understanding of what, what that, that interpretation might mean, but it, it, it satisfies some. So I just wanted to add that from the, the Jewish side of things. Um, but, but it's something that we all have to wrestle with. Um, there's one other thing that I do want to say in terms of uh, translation, right? Breshit bara. We often translate in, in the beginning. And we've talked about this before too, right? In the beginning. And the Hebrew, that's, that's not what the Hebrew says at all. Um, so there have been lots of different translations playing with this. One says in a beginning, right? Which, kind of makes one go oh how many beginnings have there been mm. yeah you know it does that does is that what's giving us a clue to the multiverse theory which is again we move the multiverse theory moved from some fringe science fiction questionable questionable um physics to well we can't prove it we can't even come up with a test to, to whether or not we can understand it but it's gaining a lot more um strength in the in the physics community this multiverse theory um so with brishis bara it's in a beginning or during the beginning of time during the beginning of the creating Right, where create where it's not creation, but in the creating, which makes sense to us. You say, Well, I'm creating a birthday cake. I'm creating a cake. Well, that doesn't mean I didn't create a cake before. I'm just telling you how I created this cake. Has nothing yeah. to do with anything else I've done or anything else I will do. It's just 
in my creating this cake, here's what happens. Right. And so it, 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 it allows for a much broader understanding of the world around us when we, when we move it away from in the beginning, making it a finite place in time and theoretically in space to something much more vague, which perhaps we're more comfortable or uncomfortable with. I think my favorite uh, hypothesis for the state of the universe is that, like, well, we discovered um, Hubble and others discovered that the uh, fabric of space itself is expanding mm -hmm. um, and that everything is getting farther away from each other by some mysterious force um, that we don't quite understand yet. And it seems to be accelerating because of that. And my favorite interpretation is that that force accelerates until it's reached its point that the force no longer works as much on it when then the opposite force starts contracting as well until you reach that point again of the singularity when it comes together and then boom again and so that the the entire universe as we know it is a sort of uh inhale exhale it's a breath oh yeah 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah that it's it's a constant cycle on some absolutely absurd time scale of creation and recreation and creation and recreation and uh mm -hmm. like that's a legit mathematically sound theory that also makes me feel um all kinds of ways inside of my soul so i like that one. yeah <laughs> I, like I like that one yeah i like that much one too. more than the one that just says it's going to expand and expand and expand until everything um all of the stars die and it's just a cold lonely death of the universe <laughs> i don't like that one as much <laughs> I, don't, I don't i don't yeah i like i like the idea of contraction right that that we can only go so far right also again that distance is on a very different scale than any of us can actually conceptualize but at some point you just get stretched to a point and then you say okay time to come back right and it's it's i don't think a rubber band is as apt as the breath but but there is a there's a limit sure uh, like you throw a ball up in the air and the force that you've imparted onto that ball is strong enough to go against gravity and so it goes yeah. up until that force is no longer sufficient and the force of gravity overpowers it and then it pulls mm -hmm. it back down to earth and yeah. that 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 sort of push and pull with the various forces of the universe. Yeah, I, I think that's beautiful because, you know, if we look at our own lives, again, just bringing it, bringing it way down, back to narcissism. Um, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> great. Sometimes. Uh, um, <laughs> our life is about push and pulls. Something is pushing me to do X, Y, and Z or is pulling me, right? I'm being pushed away from something or being pulled towards something. That is how much of our life exists. And if there's not a strong push or not a strong pull, then we're just the status quo. Um, and I think that's how we exist. So I think perhaps that's, you know, and, and as, an, as an individual, that's how we exist. So I think that that's part of what makes that concept of the universe more appealing because we can we can at least draw a parallel somewhere in our own lives to that um, i just like to imagine that um in taking this theory as uh true where our universe is this lung that's inhaling and exhaling i kind of like the picture that you know <laughs> there's just this ginormous cosmological creature and all of its limbs are the different parts of the multiverse. And our universe is the lung because it breathes in and out. Ooh. And so really, we're just tiny, microscopic. We are part of the microbiome of the cosmological beast. Ooh. Look I at like that. that. That is fascinating. And I go. like how you use the multiverse in that in that imagery 
right? That the that your that your multiverse they're happening simultaneously. Because um, I've heard of of other my multiverse theories where they are where they happen independently and are not connected to one another, but in your you know in your being they are connected somehow, like like a, a biome of some nature. I like that. Yeah, that would that would really change how how deeply rooted the butterfly effect is, huh? Yeah. <laughs> what if what we do here impacts a different universe <laughs> over there? <laughs> <laughs> that would be. There's a quote. It's a great quote. And I'm going to find it later, and then I'm going to record myself, and I'm going to give it to you people. <laughs> and <clears throat> we're going to go, meantime, whoa. In the meantime, I uh, I also have a, a bin in my kitchen filled with worms Ugh. that eat all of my um, fruit and vegetable cutoffs. Right. And I was remarking the other day that I bought those worms, I don't know, six years ago. And I looked up the lifespan of red wigglers and realized that there's an entire generation of worms who have only ever known my kitchen. Hmm. And to them, that is the entire universe. And every once in a while, the top opens up and they get this horrifying <laughs> view of the rest of the world and they slither away because they don't like light. But then they are provided with food every day. There's, there's new sustenance every day. And um, to them, that's that's it. That's the whole world. Like they would have no concept of of the stars in the sky and the deep universe and the cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, to them, it's just this. Um, so I really like the idea of what the the humility that comes from realizing that maybe our universe is not the entirety of everything, and that. Kendra's idea of it just being a lung in some kind of <laughs> cosmic being is just wonderful, right? Isn't that how Men in Black ends? Where like, yeah, well, it the, zooms the, out and then it's just in a marble or something? In a, on a cat's collar. On a cat, yeah, there you go. Yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> like the galaxy is just is just a trinket on a cat's collar. I was totally thinking <laughs> that one too. That's funny. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. We are just worms. Which is great. I love it. I love things that decentralize humanity because humanity is full um, of it. On the whole, fairly awful. <laughs> um, I think I'm with Rachel, and like I can, I'm good with persons, but people are just the worst. And uh, anything that can decentralize us and that can give us a bit of humility, I think, will make us all better citizens of the planet. Yeah, I totally. Agree. I like to think of it that way. Um. Realize we need to do a better job taking care of it. That makes me want to also share a quote that is uh, this. You, you can take this out of this episode because I don't know that it's super relevant. But my research on um, terror management theory, which is largely just a theory about how people cope with death and their own insignificance. Um there is a quote by one of the 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 founders of this theory. Um, his name's Jeff Greenberg, and he says, "The essence of terror management theory thus boils down to the idea that by sustaining our self-esteem as we view ourselves through the lens of our meaning providing worldview, we keep at bay the potential for terror engendered by the possibility that we are mere material animals clinging to a clump of dirt hurtling through an indifferent universe for a brief period of time that ends with our complete obliteration upon death. Yay! <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is not going on my vision board. <laughs> That's definitely a fun way to end the episode. That's... <laughs> <laughs> like I said, it's not exactly the high note that you might want to end on, but I just, that image of like clinging to a clump of dirt feels very similar to like the worms being afraid of the light and like all, mm. all these other things. Well, that goes back to the, the overview effect that astronauts feel when they, when they see the earth yeah. from space and they realize how insignificant everything is, or, you mm -hmm. know, the entire modern, 
environmental movement started when, what was it, Voyager turned around and took a picture of the Earth as that pale blue dot, as mm-hmm. um, uh, Carl Sagan called it, that mm-hmm. insignificant pale blue dot, uh, a fleck of dust in a sunbeam. And when people realized how small and fragile the Earth really was, the, the environmental movement began. So, uh, you know, if there is something to that, to realizing our frailty and our lack of immortality and uh, the fact that the universe as a whole is kind of doesn't care about you, um, that there may be a benevolent force uh, in, in the universe, but as uh, the laws of physics don't care about you, <laughs> you know, uh, they certainly didn't care about the dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, poor things. Right? But dinosaurs that if we zero, get our, asteroids one. If we get ourselves out of the middle of the picture and realize that we are a part of a web, then we can be better citizens of the planet and of the universe. And we can do things like clean up all the space junk we've left out there. And uh, when we can maybe not have future wars over who owns the moon, which I'm sure that will probably happen, um, which we're going to talk about in another episode as well. And uh, so I'm just a fan of anything that takes humans out of the middle and puts humanity where it belongs. Mm -hmm. So Copernican revolution away. This has been episode 65 of the Down the Wormhole podcast. As always, thanks for being on this journey with us, and a huge thanks to our patrons over at Patreon who help keep the lights on. If you'd like to help us out with hosting and recording costs, you can find us at patreon.com slash down the wormhole podcast. Join us next week as we continue our Sinai and Synapses interviews. We'll be talking with Dr. Telly Davuti, who studies the effect of religious and scientific teachings on childhood development. I ask her questions like, are children raised in religious homes more likely to reject science? Are they better at conceptualizing abstractions? Are we confusing them by teaching them about Santa Claus and Jesus at the same time, and then expecting them to be able to separate myth from religion later on? It's the perfect interview for the holiday season. And now, as I promised you like 10 minutes ago, I found that quote that I wanted to share with you. And if you've listened this far, you deserve a treat. Um, Okay, so this is from Pilgrim in Tinker Creek by Annie Dillard. I reel in confusion. I don't understand what I see. With the naked eye, I can see two million light years to the Andromeda galaxy. Often I slop some creek water into a jar, and when I get home, I dump it in a white china bowl. After the silt settles, I return and see tracings of minute snails on the bottom, a planarian or two winding around the rim of the water, round worms shimmying frantically, and finally, when my eyes have adjusted to the dimensions, amoeba. At first, the amoeba look like the musque volitanes, those curly, uh, moving spots you see in your eyes when you stare at a distant wall. Then I see the amoeba as drops of water, congealed, bluish, translucent, like chips of sky in the bowl. At length, I choose one individual and give myself over to its idea of an evening. I see it dribble a grainy foot before it on its wet, unfathomable way. Do its unedited senses in, sense impressions include the fierce focus of my eyes? Shall I take it outside and show it Andromeda and blow its little endoplasm? <laughs> I stir the water with a finger in case it's running out of oxygen. Maybe I should get a tropical aquarium with motorized bubblers and lights and keep this one for a pet. Yes, it would tell its fissioned descendants the universe is two feet by five. And if you listen closely, you can hear the buzzing music of the spheres. Mm. Ah, that's that's beautiful. so beautiful. I love mm-hmm. Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. It's, it's basically Walden Pond. I might have to buy that now. Do it.